Yo, what's good? Welcome to Observing the Process. Before we start, I'm hoping you can help me out by supporting the show. You can rate and review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. You can share it with your friends, you can blog about it, or discuss it on your own podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you can subscribe to my channel and like this video, or you can support it directly. You can do this by going to my website. I'll leave a link in the description. Thank you for supporting the show. Listeners like you make it possible. Today on the show, I had Isabel Huynh. Isabel is a DJ who I met in Shanghai, but is based now in New York. We met up to talk about skateboarding, life as a creative, and how to build an audience. Please give it up for Isabel Huynh. In the land of China, people hardly got nothing at all. No possessions? And in China, they never go to church. No religion too? Well, it's easy if you try. Three, maybe. two, one. Okay, we're live. Isabel, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Alex. How are you? <laughs> doing very good. Um, so you're back in Shanghai because you used to live here and now you live in New York. But what brings you back for this trip? Yeah, so I'm back in Shanghai because I decided to kind of do a mini tour for DJing. All right. Yeah, congrats. Like that's kind of picking up it looks really cool that you it is yeah to grow that. it was fun so i planned to go to korea and then originally it was just going to be shanghai mm. but then it turned into a bunch of other cities like guangzhou and then foshan and then last weekend was nanning and mm. then korea so sweet so how did you like get into that is that something that you went out of your way to set up or did someone reach out to you or for the tour? For the tour, yeah, specifically. Oh, like getting tour? in touch with the venues and stuff like that. That's like an interesting process. The tour was like originally, it was my aunt was getting married. She oh, got really? married like two days ago. Oh, congrats. And my whole family was like, <laughs> we're going to go to China. I was like, word, then I'm going to go to China for a month. Mm. And so then I planned to do it for a month and then just figure it out. But basically through my connections of living here to a year ago when I lived here, mm. I had connections from DJing here and they set me up with some stuff. Mm. Okay. That's really cool. So you just like reached out to venues and were like, can I get a set or was it? It was more so through like a booking agent who mm. usually will book artists from the U.S. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, that's awesome. I'm, I'm super psyched to see you like touring and stuff like that. It, it's really cool. But before we jump into that, let's go a little bit further back. Like, where are you from? And yeah, where are you from? I'm I'm from San Diego. Mm. I went to college in Santa Barbara. Okay. And then after I graduated, I moved to Shanghai. I mm -hmm. moved. I lived here for two years and then mm -hmm. I was in New York for a year. Awesome. In Santa Barbara or is that where you said you just grew up? I went to college in Santa San, Barbara. But you I grew up in, up San, in San, San Diego. Diego. San yeah. Diego. Okay. So in San Diego, did you, cause I know you skateboard as well. And mm -hmm. something I was interested in is like, did you always skateboard or did you get into it later in life or what's the story behind that? I started skating when I was 18 and okay. I had just graduated high school and I was at the Carmel Valley skate park in mm. San Diego and I my friend was doing a photo shoot and I just saw the people skating and I was like, that looks awesome. Mm. So then I decided to just do it myself. Cool. Cool. And what was that like as a girl skater getting into the scene? Was there a lot? Cause something eventually I want to talk about is, um, you know, meeting people in Shanghai versus the West coast versus the East coast. But in terms of getting started in skateboarding, in uh, San Diego, what was that like? For I was you? so scared to go <laughs> to skate parks in San. Like when I first started skating, I, I was just a little closer to your mouth. Yeah. I would get super scared. I would walk up to the park and I would literally be shaking, just being <laughs> like, "Oh my god, people are gonna see that I'm super bad." But then over time, you get used to the energy right. and what it's like. And actually, at the end of the day, nobody cares about what you're doing or. Mm like how good you are. It's just about you trying and sure, having fun. Sure. Sure. Yeah. For me in, I found that Shanghai happens to be one of the most accepting places to meet people for skating. Like, Oh, for um, sure. Yeah. yeah. The circle is very welcoming here. Mm, mm. Yeah. And, and it's cool because like there aren't even really any skate parks in Shanghai actually. So even meeting people at a spot is, is where you tend to say what's up and try and get to know people. And for me in America, it was kind of like parks were the only people, like I would never really approach another group of skaters at a spot Yeah, in true, New York or true. California. You know what You'd I mean? You'd have to like know someone 
that will introduce you to other people yeah. first. Yeah. I, so for me, when I came here, I was, it was like a really nice relief and, um, something I'm still psyched about today is like, you can roll up to any group of people and just say what's up and start skating. And it, it's not a big deal while right. in like, even California, if I go to the park, I'm not necessarily going to start like a conversation unless I don't know. It has to be very organic. I don't know. Yeah. When I was skating, when I was first skating in California, I would just go to parks by myself mm. early, like at nine. Mm. For and, like an hour and then and leave. What were you riding? Like, did, did you remember your first board and all that? Or like, was I that important I think it to was you? a toy machine because okay. I loved toy machine. <laughs> That's cool. Actually, that can kind of jump into the next thing is like the graphics on skateboards. And then also you've done graphic design. Is that what you studied at school or? No, I didn't. Mm. I didn't learn graphics work until I moved to Shanghai mm. and I was working at an English school. Okay. And then they needed someone to try to draw their textbooks because they manufacture their own. They make everything themselves. Hmm. So they wanted someone to draw the cartoons that go with the stories. Okay. And then I tried drawing one and they were like, yeah, this is good hmm. enough. <laughs> and then I just, you know, kept doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's reminding me we had a while back. I had this idea to make like a skateboarding cartoon book. I don't know if you remember me telling you this. Kind of. That <laughs> yeah. sounds really familiar. Yeah. So I told you about it and I was thinking, cause I have this, like, you know, I teach skateboarding lessons and, um, I was thinking it'd be kind of cool and like, just to make it more fun for the kids to learn and something to take home, they could have like a cartoon book, like a little story of like, but you know who already did it? Like Henry Jones. I don't know if you know that, uh, uh, cartoonist, that animator, um, yeah, he already did one with like Carl Watson, which another skaters. You should definitely from check here? that out. No, Henry Jones is from, uh, I believe he's based in California, Oh, but, um, yeah. So you should have done it anyways. Yeah. I feel like. I, I, so his was for the people in China. Mm, you should have done. Yeah. It that's a good point. That's what's interesting about China is like, it's a whole, like a lot of the guests I've had, um, when they like come here, they're trying to do something maybe that's already been done before, but like in China, it definitely hasn't been done a lot of time. For example, RG Hamilton started like the festival scene, but festivals have been around in America and Europe forever. Yeah. And then like the comedy scene, but Andy Curtin, he had like kind of in initiated it here. So there's always an opportunity to kind of like start something new, like a new wave of stuff happening. Yeah. Because the people here, I feel like aren't aware mm. of a lot of things things outside of China. Yeah. I mean, well, for example, like they have their own internet. The the, the internet is blocked. For, like, so everything is kind of like new to them in some regards. Yeah. I've been hating that so much. The mm, VPN. Right. Right. So like when you come back, it's totally like you got to get on the VPN again. It's such a pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah. I totally feel you. Um, I want to get back to San Diego a little and then our California. Cause what did you go to school for then? I studied global and international studies. Okay. Um, it was kind of just a major that I had to choose by default. Mm. I originally wanted to be an accountant. Mm. Really? <laughs> yeah. So Little I, buns accounting. So <laughs> I went to bunny. Santa Barbara. I went to UCSB specifically because I liked their accounting program. Mm. And then I didn't get in because okay. it was really, really competitive. Mm. And then... I mean, I guess that was a blessing in disguise, but also one of the saddest things that happened to me because I tried super hard to pass the exam, oh. but I didn't pass. So it's just a sign that it wasn't meant to be. Mm. So what did you end up doing then for school? Like your So major. I did the global studies. The global studies. They were like, okay. you can either be global studies or psych. Mm. And then I was like, global studies. I try. I did psychology for a year and um, it was not for me. Like for me, I, I enjoyed the um you know the evaluating the the theory side of it but there's a lot of science and even biology i think that was going into it which made it quite difficult yeah i took psych 101 and i couldn't pay attention <laughs> it was so complicated to me yeah so what i ended up doing actually is um marketing instead of psychology when i transferred schools and um i think that was a really good choice because marketing like has some of the psychology behind it. Like you use psychology, but not the super scientific, like specific stuff. And I yeah. was able to use, you know, business, which is fun and kind of use it today with social media and, you know, branding yourself in a sense. Wait, where did you go to school? I went to school in Burlington, Vermont. So I actually started at URI, University of Rhode Island, and I didn't like it. 
told the story a hundred times. And so I ended up going to on the podcast. <laughs> so anyways, I didn't like URI and I transferred to Champlain and I don't know if you've ever been to Vermont or no, no. Yeah. Vermont's amazing. Like for snowboarding, the mountains and all that stuff. It's so nice. And they just got this brand new skate park, maybe like two years ago. It's amazing. It was actually the, um, 500th park built for the Tony Hawk foundation. Oh, whoa. I don't know if you're familiar with the Tony Hawk foundation, but it's really cool because Tony Hawk, obviously legendary skater, but with a lot of his money and his fame, he, he created a foundation where he'll build skate parks all around the country, kind of in places where they need them. So Vermont like needed a skate park in this one area. They like, they had one that was super crusty and basically Tony Hawk will go in there with his foundation. And if someone applies, you can like apply with a grant and they'll, like work with the community to design it and implement it. Mm. Yeah, it was really cool. I, I don't think you need to know anything about that growing up in California because you guys had like everything. Lots of skate parks, <laughs> everything. Yeah. Yeah. Surfers. Surfing. For sure. For sure. Thanks. So I kind of want to move on to why did you come to China in the first place? Like when you when you graduated, let's let's like you're graduating college. What what's like the transition then? So I graduated and I was working at this cafe just not knowing what I was going to do. Mm. And then one of my family friends like reached out to my mom and was like, Isabel just graduated, right? Does she want to be a teacher mm. in China? <laughs> and then my mom came to me and she was like, do you want to be teaching in China? And I was like, heck no, <laughs> I don't want to live in China. Yeah. Cause I had been here before multiple times. Um, oh really? So you've been here Tell us, go to that then. Why Why did you come to China? I like, I grew up going to Beijing during the summer sometimes mm. to see my grandma okay. and stuff. So your heritage is Chinese. Then. I'm half. I'm half, half Chinese. Half Chinese. I'm half Chinese, half Vietnamese. Half Vietnamese. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So you would go to Beijing. What was that like? Did you enjoy going on these trips? Or? No, no. I was like <laughs> six, seven, and then my mom would just ditch us at home. Sorry, mm. mom. She would ditch us at home and then we would just be hanging out. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. But then like another time I was in Shanghai when I was 16 mm. doing an externship. Like externship. That, which is like an out of country internship. Oh, okay. I get it. <laughs> and I did it at this exact company that I started working for. Oh. So I kind of knew what I was going to get into. That's why I was like, no, mm. I'm okay. Right, right, right. But then I thought about it after five days and was at my cafe job and I was just like, maybe I should go. Mm, right. Right. Cause for me, um, I remember I was like about to graduate and I didn't know what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. So you had already graduated though. Right. You yeah. Just, yeah. So for me, I, I was like about to graduate and like not in panic mode, but like, I want to figure this out like <laughs> before. So that's funny that you have like somewhat of like directly after college, basically you're going there. And yeah. So did you say like, you were going to Beijing, but this job happened to be in Shanghai. Yes. So did you have any desire maybe to go? Had you been to Shanghai before that? Or was it only going back to Beijing to visit like family? I had been here for the externship. The externship was in Shanghai. Oh, okay. 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 I thought it was in Beijing. Yeah. The same exact company. Um, and right. I was here for like two months mm. during the summer. Mm. Or if I think, yeah, two months. Did you meet the skaters then or? No, I wasn't skating at that time. I oh. was only like 16. Oh, okay. It was like too young to go out anywhere without it being weird. Mm. But then like old yeah, enough yeah, yeah, yeah. to want to be going out. Okay. So 16 to the, like, how old are you when you're graduating college? Like in your mid early twenties, right? Yeah. Like 21. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's like quite a gap then. between. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So then now you're going back to Shanghai and you're skating at this point. What was like, did you have, did you know anyone else or was it like, I'm just going to do this job? Uh, no, I didn't. Wow. I didn't know anyone. Yeah. For me, like at least I knew some people. When like I was, you had friends. Yeah. Yeah. I had like John saw and Brian Kleiber. Like oh, I, I knew those dudes cause they had all gone to Vermont to college with me. Oh no way. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah. So like I knew some people. So that was like a very comforting for me to at least like have a foundation of people I would know. Yeah. Well, you know what? I didn't know them, know them. I just like, they went to the same school. So we like, it was very natural for us when I came here to like, say what's up. Like, can we both skate? But yeah. So, cause something like something I used to tell people was like anyone and everyone should come to China 
if like you don't know necessarily what you want to do, like mm-hmm. you can come and teach English just like you did. Right. So what what do you think about that? Would you recommend your journey like to people or? It depends. Yeah. I wasn't happy mm. here for. Oh, when you first moved. Yeah. A lot oh. of the time I was like. What time of the year did you move? I think that has. I a... moved in December. Right. It so, was very cold. <laughs> it's very cold. It's You don't really want to be going out and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. But I was, I already knew that I didn't really want to be here, mm. but I still came. Yeah. Um, but if I were to tell someone to come, I would say yes, if they didn't know what they wanted to do. Mm. Because at honestly, at the end of the day, me DJing, me doing graphic design, me doing all the work that I do now, mm. I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't come to Shanghai. Right. Right. At all. I think um, that's super important to talk about is like, for me, it's very similar. The doors that Shanghai has opened, the opportunity that's here, you, I've not really found anywhere else. Right. Yeah. 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 I um, I got into video production out here. I was able to intern with Push. I was able to work on commercials that I never really thought I would be able to work yeah. on. Yeah. It was pretty cool. And for you, so you weren't DJing before you came out here. How did you get, did you get into that while you were in Shanghai, like learning about it and. Exactly. Like I didn't start DJing until like, uh, six months before I moved, Mm. like six or eight months before I moved away. Mm. Um, and I only started DJing because I have a friend who runs like a hip hop label Mm. and it's called Preem. Okay. Like, you know how there's STD and shift and then Preem and then like Yo Hood and all those. So Preem is, they're specifically booking like hip hop artists. Mm. All their parties are only hip hop. And I was close with the founder and he asked me to make the flyer for mm. a party one time. And then randomly he was like, do you want a DJ? Cause he knew that I loved music. I've always loved music. And then I was like, I guess so. Mm. And then I did it. Yeah. That's interesting. Like that your, your first, I don't know, maybe you still do graphic design, but like that kind of hobby or career path, like, like evolved into DJ like through that yeah, door. That's, yeah. that's interesting for something I want to talk about is like, I think a lot of people can, like some people look, not look down on DJs, but they look at it as like kind of simple. You know what I mean? Like you're just putting yeah. music together, but I, I'm sure it's a lot more complex than that. So I wanted to like to talk to you about like your process of like building a mixtape and maybe explain like the, like what is more deeper in that rather than like people's like first glance, like at how it. to be a successful DJ or like <laughs> how to not, what mm. do you mean? What I mean is like, sometimes like it's, it's some people look at it. It's like, Oh, you're just like pressing play, mm-hmm. but it's not as simple as that. I don't, I, I would imagine it's not as simple as just pressing play. And then the crowd goes wild. So I'm, I'm wondering like your like thoughts, like what's actually complicated about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Or like what, what is like, my your struggles? process, not, not, I don't know about your struggles, but like what you like about it, like the process of like making like a, like a DJ set. Cause that's also very different from building beats. Building beats is truly like original thing yeah. versus like a DJ set is kind of like stringing song after song. Is that right? Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to like kind of hear from you, your process for how do you even like select which song will come after next or like, is there technique to it or you know what i mean well it it really depends on the event that mm. i'm djing okay um i do a radio show and for the radio shows i just play underground which is all the stuff that i personally like mm-hmm. that i still think are really good for mm-hmm. the general public okay but then when i'm djing at clubs that can get really weird though sometimes mm. because people expect some mainstream but then mm. they also want you to somehow be a little bit different than mm-hmm. being mainstream right. like a radio yeah like a radio radio mm. um <laughs> yeah no because like my cousin djs and he would tell me that um you know there's there's like a there's a technique to knowing like what the crowd wants to hear at that moment like you should be choosing the proper music and like not like you just press play for 60 minutes and it just goes like maybe you even like switch it up as you're going. Yeah, no, not at all. I, yeah. I never have a set playlist. Like I right. never go one, two, three, four, and I have all these tracks in a list. Okay. I always go like it's called, I guess like free 
for, I freestyle. Like okay. I'll just look at my list and yeah. I look at the crowd. And if I think they want to hear something, I'll play that. If mm -hmm. I think they want to hear something else. And you can also test people, like play a song for like 15 seconds. And mm -hmm. if it isn't going, you change it immediately. Right, right. Yeah. And then something else you mentioned is like, you actually don't really play your beats for an audience. Like you actually will produce beats for certain artists. So what's that been like reaching out to artists and collaborating and. Oh yeah. Um, so, well, when you asked me, it was like, uh, do I post my beats somewhere? Right, that's right. And I, I don't do that just because I would rather not have random people just rap over something that mm. I made. Okay. Um, the way that I do it is actually like the way that I did this, my very first collab with this guy named Satori Zoom. I was listening to that. It was pretty dope. Like oh, he, thank he, you. Yeah, I, was, I found it on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, pretty, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Really good. Um, but I found him through SoundCloud. Mm. Um, and I just, I loved the song that he put out. It was called Lockout. Mm. And then I found his Instagram. He has like very little following, so, mm. which was a surprise to me. And then I ended up DMing him and just being like, hey, if I make you a beat, mm. would you rap over it? And he was, he just said, I'm down. <laughs> and then yeah. we made body. <laughs> That's what's up. I think Instagram and social media is such an amazing new tool for people to use. Like I used to be so like when in the early internet days, I wouldn't like reach out to random people and start random conversations. But now as I'm more comfortable with Instagram and you know, I have a bit of a following and people like to talk to me and it's, it's just such a cool place and like a different way to interact yeah. with people. Now, the only thing that sucks is trying to do it in China mm. because you have to do the VPN. Right. And right. I've been using Astro and it's still, <laughs> even then it's still like a pain. In the do you butt. get on any Chinese social media or? No, I tried use to it. use Weibo, but it was so confusing to me. Right. I, me too. Exactly. The it's same confusing, thing. It's confusing, right? It's like an ugly interface. I, I just like can't be bothered with it. But you know, Tang has had a ton of success working yeah. with uh, TikTok <laughs> recently. He uses Douyin, which is like the Chinese one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. And he'll make those like <laughs> skate clips. Exactly. He'll get mad views on those skate clips. Um, yeah. So it kind of makes me wonder, like, should I be investing in that or maybe, maybe, but, but like, it's like another thing to add. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Did, does social media take over your life at all? Do you feel like you oh, spend totally. Okay. So you I feel the same way. Like I get very frustrated with how much time I spend. I want to like it. not look at my phone mm. for a certain time of period, period mm. of time, but right. I just, I know I can't sometimes. Mm. Yeah. That was, that was something I was thinking about. Like, cause like today, like you're, you're going after a journey that is like kind of being your own boss, being mm -hmm. like an entrepreneur with right. like building a brand for yourself, like as a DJ. And I'm doing something similar with Shanghai Observed where I yeah. want to like sell shirts and stuff like that. So like for me, it's actually like I have to force myself to be on a schedule and really be mm -hmm. like pushing myself to get work done rather than like going to an office. I don't know what it's like for you. Do you find you're enjoying it more a life of being like somewhat of an entrepreneur or I, I love my schedule. Mm. Like I love that I can set my own terms and what I need to be doing at what times. Mm. Um, I guess the only thing that sucks is like just looking at my phone constantly yeah. or, well, I think it's cool that Shanghai observed is like a name that mm. you're behind. Yeah. For me, it's, myself and I feel really self-centered sometimes. Mm. Like I don't want to think about myself all the right. time. That's a good way to look at Yeah. Cause that's something I actually really enjoy about what I've done is like, it's not my face. Yeah. It's a, like, it's a brand. Yeah. Right. So I'm lucky in that regard that, um, I don't have necessarily my face, but like in a, in a like it's a catch 22 because if I want to really, it's harder to monetize like my, like certain things that you can do with an Instagram with yourself as a brand, it's easier to monetize it to like post ads, like on your story, or it, it's just, a, I think it's personally a little easier to monetize an Instagram or a social media account. If there's a face and a person behind it versus like posting. versus a brand, like, which is what I have, which kind of like I can't like speak to my audience with my face it wouldn't it doesn't make sense at all they don't they don't know there's like a really a face behind it like that's kind of the, yeah. the way I've built it 
which is funny because I do this podcast and I'm so open about it, <laughs> but like on the Instagram itself, it's like kind of its own thing. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's almost like there's just like thousands of cameras always recording on Shanghai and it like ends up on the feed is like kind of the way I envision what I'm doing. But yeah. So anyways, like building your own personal brand, it's, it's hard. Do you wish that your face was on Shanghai Observed? Um, do I wish that my face was on Shanghai Observed? Like, do you Observed? wish people knew it was you? Um, not, like, not, not really, no. I'm kind of happy in the end that it, it like, what it is, is it's okay. But I would, like, it kind of is, like, it's not hard to find out who I am. Like, if you search Shanghai Observed on Google, like, you know, this podcast will come up. My w- website will come up. And mm. there is, like... The podcast teaser has my face on it. So it's not something that I like get terribly upset with if someone knew that. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't. I think it's awesome. Mm. I tell all my friends, I'm like, yeah, my friends started that. <laughs> that's that's the weird thing it is like when people because it's like they want to talk about it. But in a sense, it's like I've created kind of like a reposting account where like, yes, like I feel like I've curated something, but it isn't that creative in terms of like my artistic ability in a sense. I I get what you're saying. Yeah. So that's why I can get a little frustrated. Like when they're so impressed or like when people are like, Oh my God, I can't believe it's you. And it's like, "Mm," like, I'm happy. Like, don't get me wrong. This is awesome. But yeah, I, I'm, that's why I'm doing this. It's like I feel like some. This is like a new challenge, podcasting, mm. like creating something that's truly mine. You know? Right. That's that's I guess why. Like, and the reason why I started the podcast is because, you know, with Shanghai Observed, I do have this platform that I'm trying to like leverage in one way or another by using them as an audience or connecting with people, like to show them different expats. Like that's kind of why. Like I was so happy to have you on. Like you were an expat in Shanghai for a certain period of time. Mm-hmm. Um. Do you miss Shanghai? Sometimes. Mm. Um, I miss how cheap it is. Yeah, I bet. And it's very convenient. I miss being able to pay for something in 30 seconds and then walk out. Yep. yep. Um, it's super crazy that those machines do face identification. Yeah. It's Dude, really weird. It's bizarre. Like now even at um Binjang that the the vending machine yeah. pay with your face is you what You just it says. stand in front of it and your ID number shows up. That is some creepy shit. <laughs> It was pretty wild. Um, all right, so that's what you miss. And what? Why did you end up leaving Shanghai? What, what was like towards the end of your Shanghai journey? What was that like? I knew that I had wanted to leave. I just didn't know when. Hmm. So basically, I finished a year contract with the company I was with, hmm. and we were also working on six books, like textbooks. So I had to make a bunch of different drawings Mm. every week my deadline was. And so I decided after I finished that, then I would go back. Right. Right. So it took me like a year and eight months. Mm. And then at the end of that time, I had just left. Right. Like, did you move directly to New York or? Uh, I went back to San Diego for a month and then I went to New York, Mm. but I always knew I wanted to go to New York. Right. Right. So you just kind of like chilled out in San Diego and then how did you set up for New York? Did you kind of just like move there? Like it was like moving to Shanghai. It Mm. just had two check-in bags and a carry on. Sweet. And you didn't really know anyone either there or no, I had two, two friends that lived there. Cool. Cool. That must make it quite a bit easier. It did. It Mm. made it a lot easier for sure. Yeah. So that's like kind of what I wanted to talk about making friends in New York versus making friends in Shanghai. What do you, how do you like, what's the nightlife scene there? Cause I I'm from New York, but I actually never lived in Manhattan as an adult. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm actually curious myself because like, I know it's so expensive. Um, and I feel like there's like definitely an energy that makes it a little harder to meet people. Like, you know, there's like a stereotypical New Yorker attitude. Oh, so, for sure. So what's your experience been like? For me, it's a little bit different just because I work in nightlife mm. and I like it's by default. I will meet new people right. every day, pretty much mm. um, as a general person mm. going out. I could see it being 
harder just right. because when you go to a bar, you just hang out with your friends mm. and there's no, not really a point in talking to anyone else. I, I could understand that. Um, so I could see it being hard compared to Shanghai. Shanghai is way easier to make friends though, mm. because especially if you're a foreigner, you can just like turn to the person next to you and be like, yeah, what that guy say? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. And also I was talking to someone else recently, like there's a, the expat community I, I didn't realize like I was taking it for granted and I feel like it's a very strong community more so than I realized. Like it's easy for me to reach out to like people on WeChat here just cause like, you know, you're a foreigner living here. It, it, it like, you're more comfortable asking someone for help. If I was in New York, I don't think I would be like asking people for help as much as I do because yeah. number one, I'm native, like English speaker there. Number two though, it's like that expat community doesn't exist as much right. in New York. Yeah. Do you, is there an expat community in New York or do you like, it's not like you would consider yourself in an expat community. Like everyone is just not really from New York. Yeah. Kind of. I yeah. don't, I, I don't really meet a lot of locals. Mm. I think. Yeah. I, I don't know many, like there's not that many people that are like born and raised in New mm-hmm. York city that you're going to meet there. From there yeah. yeah. Far and few between. Yeah. Um, something else I was curious about is like when you're making music, do you you have someone that you look up to like certain artists that inspire you or when I'm making music, not, not not only when you're making music, just in general, like artists that inspire you. I have like my favorite rappers. Go for it. Let me know. Oh, um, my favorite rappers are smoke perp. Okay. Rob Banks, um, Suicide Boys mm-hmm. and uh, this girl named Coyle Ray. Okay. Yeah, because Tang was telling me um, you have like kind of a good connection with the underground scene in a sense. And he was like, he was really psyched when you came up to Toronto. You did a show up there, right? Oh, yeah. That was that was so funny. I, tell, I got, tell us about that. That was like, I was booked by someone through Instagram Mm. basically. And then I told Johnny that I would be there and he was like, word, that's so (laughs) awesome. Let's hang out. So then we hung out when I went up there, but that was really fun. And Mm. then we skated. Sure. Sure. What was the first time that you got booked? Like, um, was that a, like a big moment for you or was it kind of like where just in booked for a show? Like someone like wanted to book you and pay you to. I mean, to I do guess music. it would have been in Shanghai at okay. like Arkham or something. Really? Um, it's it's really exciting, but I would only get booked once a month or so. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Right. You just really gotta like pop around and really mm. show that that's what you do, basically. Or otherwise, yeah. people won't reach out to you. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. You gotta like kind of be your own boss, <laughs> like yeah. really pushing yourself to get out there and. Yeah, which is why being on social media is really important, but also exhausting. Mm, mm. And you mostly focus on just like hip hop beats, right? Yeah. Yeah. Something I was thinking about was um, hip hop in general. I was listening to, um, it was an episode of Joe Rogan with RZA, you know, from Wu-Tang Clan. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned, he was talking about just like, they, they were joking around that like, you know, Oh, like, oh, I want Joe Rogan to spit like spit like 16. It means like spit like bars, like yeah. a rhyme. And then they got into somehow just like the origin of rap. Like, at, like for sure, maybe African-Americans were like the foundation of rap and hip hop. Mm-hmm. But the way RZA explained it, like it made me feel good that he was to someone. He's a very educated guy. I highly recommend people listen to this podcast because RZA just spoke about so many things that were insightful. Anyways. He was going on about how like hip hop is actually just like an American thing where it's not just about like African-Americans and and, like it's not about excluding people from doing it. Like I think if you look at Eminem, he had like a terribly hard time being accepted by the community of just rap in general. And that has changed over time. So I was curious, maybe your thoughts about hip hop or like where like it's what it means to you or why you focus on hip hop beats and I I definitely think hip hop is an American thing. Like Mm. if you look, if you go around the world, like all the rappers, all the hip hop artists in Mm. different countries, they're trying to be like American artists Mm. at the end of the day. Um, I specifically focus on hip hop because I know that 
that's what I like. Mm. And if I were to choose any un- other genre, it would just sound weird. Right. Yeah. It's, so it's just about being like kind of true to yourself. Yeah. So, yeah. and I think that's what would make a DJ successful is if you tell people what you actually like mm. versus being like, oh, you DJ? Yeah, I do. <laughs> what do you play? Everything. Mm. Like that doesn't, it doesn't really help you. Right. I would right. say. I, I, I definitely agree. Like, cause when I think about that, I think about just trying to lock down myself as a professional, like in video production, I want to do everything. But if I say I do everything, you know, no one really wants to hire from me yeah. for that one job. Yeah. It's, it's very similar. Yeah, That's yeah. very similar. Yeah. So like I, I technically can do a bit of everything. Mm-hmm. Like I can edit, I can fly a drone, I can operate a camera, can do lighting audio, but you know, someone wants to hire you for what you like your niche is, what you're very good at. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I guess that, yeah, that kind of can correlate to all different things like hip hop itself or sorry, DJing and producing. All the, all the creative work totally has mm. that type of thing. Yeah. That's something that I struggle with though, is because I want to do a bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that's awesome that like, if you're able to, you found what you truly love and like you're going a hundred percent in it. Do you, how else do you spend your time like in New York if you're not like working on DJing or are you still spending a bunch of time on graphic design? Or? A lot. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've been freelancing since mm. I moved there. Um, it took me a while to start getting work, mm. but basically it was just through me doing my mix covers mm. for my, uh, for my mixes and then also doing my flyers for Mm. my parties and people would see them and be like, Hey, can you do my flyer for my party? Mm. And then I would tell them, yeah, sure. And if it was like a friend, like a close friend, I would be like, yeah, I'll do it for free. But then slowly over time, it would be for bigger labels. Mm. And I would be like, yeah, I'm charging now. You should tell them. (laughs) That's what's up. Yeah. I think at some point you got to like lay down the law. Like it for sure. You need to do those free gigs. Yeah. But then like it, yeah, it's, it's a scary decision. I think to know when to lock down a price and stuff like that. Even with DJing, like I started doing stuff for free Hmm. at the beginning. Yeah. Just like graphics. I did it for free at first. Yeah. That's awesome. But it grows. It's like if people see it and you're actually doing something good, Mm. they'll want you. Definitely. That made me, that reminded me of like, you know, Winston who does turd out mm-hmm. here. Yeah. At first, I'm, I'm going to have him on the show and, um, Oh cool. Yeah. Yeah. He's here randomly. You know, he moved to Chengdu. Actually. Yeah. Somebody told me. Yeah. Pretty wild. Like he, is and he here now? He's here in Shanghai now. I think, um, until mid December, he doesn't have a flight back yet, but, um, yeah. Like at first to be honest, and I'll even tell him this, like I did not like, turd in general like you know what i mean like just the idea of like turd like but are you gonna say it to him on the show i, I, I won't say it like that Winston, and, and I, don't, I don't like turd and it's not that i don't like turd like it's just like you it, the branding just seemed like you know a little like oh but actually it kind of plays well because it's like he didn't need to think it doesn't matter what the brand is he was actually doing something and that's what i most respect him for yeah. and like because he was like when no one in the scene was doing anything out here like he kind of like saw an opportunity and went for it and like like uh kind of united a group of skaters and is actually sure. putting content out of Shanghai. A right lot now. of Chinese skaters too. Yeah, well that, that's what I'm saying. Like he really did something positive for the skate community. Like a lot of brands will mostly utilize foreigners. And it's like mm-hmm. what's sad is like they'll even utilize foreigners who have a Chinese face and it's like you're doing it like for all the wrong reasons. Like they just want to like yeah, well like Winston was is truly working with like the Chinese community. Yeah. And so I anyways, I think that's really cool that something like that has evolved in Shanghai. And the, the name is still really interesting to me. Yeah. What, what, what's interesting about it to you? What, it's just turd <laughs> like poo. Yeah, sure. Like I was talking to him the other day, like I was talking at the skate park and I was just like, yeah, man, it's cool. Like you just took the poop emoji and, <laughs> and kind of just rolled with it. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, emoji. pretty much, pretty much. That's what I did. And, um, he said, uh, what was he saying? It's like his full-time job now. He actually does that full time, oh, which is what? super sick. That's yeah. awesome. So he's out there in Chengdu. Maybe I'll run into him. Yeah. I mean, like, when do you leave again? You leave on. I leave next Tuesday. Mm. Next yeah. Tuesday. Back to New York. Yeah. And what's, what is waiting for you in New York? Oh, I, I have a couple stuff yeah. lined up. Yeah. Mm. 
like DJing, like mm-hmm. just yeah, getting back I have to some it. DJ stuff. I have an EP release with this girl mm. from New York and then just some parties. That's what's up. That's what's up. As we start to wrap this up, uh, could you let people know where they can find you, like how they can follow you, how they can stay in touch? So my Instagram is Lil Bun Buns. <laughs> you know, what? before we wrap up, what what is the story behind that? I mean, obviously you have these great Lil Bun Buns. It's but just my hair. Like that, that's honestly all it is. Did someone like give you that nickname or you were kind of just like, oh, this is no, kind of no, cool? No, no, I made it. Yeah. yeah. It was just a funny name and then I did it. That's cool. That's but cool. I get like, I'll get weird comments from people about it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever... Um, engage with these weird comments no on- not at all i ignore <laughs> them but i also hate when i'm like walking out when i'm out in new york and mm. people will be like oh little bun buns and i'm just like <laughs> they'll recognize you mm-hmm. you've been recognized i've been called out on the streets before oh, like wow. from across the street that's interesting it was really weird like yeah. Yeah, I I actually I've only been recognized once from my podcast, which was pretty cool. But for me, it was just like I don't know. I Here? guess yeah, in Shanghai Whoa. by a, a, a random expat. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, but I guess you have like your trademark on your head, so it's a little easier to like yeah. spot you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So Instagram, little bum buns. Instagram, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Music, <laughs> uh, Twitter. I don't really use Twitter. What else do I have? Um, so you have like a a mix cloud or something? It's like mix a mix cloud. Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought that was kind of. It's funny that there's like a mix cloud and a sound cloud. Is there a difference? I, I, well, oh, mix there's cl- totally a difference. Mix cloud is more of just like like hour long format or like mix a- cloud can let you post whatever you want and mm. they won't take it down. Oh. But sound cloud they have more restrictions. Mm. Like if you repost. If you upload a Travis Scott song, mm. they'll immediately take it down. Well, the mixed cloud they, is pretty They have lawless. really good like copyright uh, like s- agreements with. I mean, yeah, that, that makes sense though because like as you get more popular, wouldn't you be pretty bummed if someone started like kind of make money yeah, off of yeah, the music in a that good you produced? Way, in a good way, they have it, yeah. but in the bad way for me was like I would make remixes where mm. I made my own beats, but I used the vocals of songs i liked mm. like 21 savage or like smoke perp mm. and they would take it down because they can they can see the sound waves yeah, of yeah. the vocals. it's smart enough to be able to find yeah that. yeah yeah that makes sense on instagram like if i try and repost like use a song for an edit you know what you can do is actually just like slow down the song by one percent and it will like tweak it enough that you can post it Dude, on Instagram. Will they take stuff down? Well, Instagram, yeah, Instagram will take stuff down. So I didn't know like, that. Even even Johnny's uh, clip got taken down like last week because it had a song that he didn't own rights to. Yep. Basically, yep. So, I didn't even know that. Yeah, so that can happen. Gotta gotta stay wise. Well, Isabel, let's wrap this up. This was awesome. Let's maybe go drink some more soju. Yes. All right. Let's go. All right. Thank Later, you guys. so much. Peace. Boom. That's it. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this podcast valuable, there are many ways you can support it. You can rate and review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. You can share it with your friends. You can blog about it or discuss it on your own podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you can subscribe to this channel and like the video, or you can support it directly. You can do this by going to my website. I'll leave a link in the description. Thank you for supporting the show. Listeners like you make it possible. Also, if you enjoyed the intro and outro music, it was made by my brother, Danny Greenberg. You can go and check out his beats at soundcloud.com slash estoric, E-S-T-O-R-I-C. Okay, that's it for now. Peace.